Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Movius, and I am the president of the Civil War Roundtable Congress. And tonight, Len Rydell, executive director of the Blue and Gray Education Society, is with us. Thank you, Len, for joining us. Great. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Mike. <laughs> you bet. Uh, Len, uh, please tell us about your background, uh, where you grew up, went to school, your family, profession. Oh, heavens. Well, I'm a uh... I'm an old Air Force guy. Uh, uh, I, I uh, was born in New Orleans back in 1953 and um, uh, uh, grew up uh, under the shadow of, uh, of Robert E. Lee looking down upon us and uh, then uh, was, a, was a Navy brat. So I spent most of my career uh, or most of my uh, years growing up in the Atlantic fleet. My dad was in Norfolk, Virginia. And um, with one exception, we found ourselves down in uh, 1965, 64, 65. Um, we were down in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Dad was at Engel's Shipyard, and one of his jobs as uh, superintendent of shipbuilding down there was they got this hunk of junk that came out of the Yazoo River. Uh, it's not too terribly uh, long before we were left. It was just a big pile of stuff. Uh, used to be the USS Cairo, and um, uh, my dad had the responsibility of keeping that thing wet uh, in, uh, around the clock because they just brought the stuff down and dumped it into the into the shipyard and and put hoses on it constantly because they didn't want any any dry rot to get in the timbers that had just come up because as you may remember it was bust into pieces. Um, I came back uh, to um, uh, to uh, Virginia back to Norfolk in uh, '71 and graduated from Granby High School and went. Uh, to Virginia Military Institute, uh, where I was uh, a biology major, graduated in 1975. Um, uh, I did not graduate with honors. Uh, I didn't even graduate in the top 80% of my class, <laughs> but I did graduate in four years. Uh, from there, went into the Air Force and um, uh, was in air traffic control and airspace management. My career evolved th through that, uh, through the late 70s, took me um, uh, to Myrtle Beach and, and Indiana and Guam and uh, staff school back in Biloxi, Mississippi. And then I was a uh, airspace manager for Third Air Force over in uh, Mildenhall, England, went off to, uh, to Germany to be the chief air traffic uh, operations for the only uh, nuclear fighter wing in uh, Europe. It was a dual, dual wing uh, mission. Uh, and then I went from there, became a uh, uh, the Air Force Chief of Airspace Management at Langley, and uh, from there went on to command uh, the 647th Communications Squadron down in down in uh, Del Rio, Texas, at Laughlin Air Force Base, and finished up my career um, as the uh, DoD Exchange Officer uh, with the FAA, uh, responsible for uh, special projects and base closures. The first round of base closures. My job was to integrate all the air traffic control systems that had been uh, U.S. Air Force and military and bring them back into the civil, uh, into the civil system. Um, and uh, uh, once I retired, I got married in 1990 uh, to, to a William and Mary girl, and we had uh, uh, one child. And by the time uh, 1994 rolled around, I spent six or seven months without, um, uh, without ever seeing my daughter awake because I'd have to leave so early in the morning to catch the train and come back so late at night. When the FAA offered me a job when I left the military, I turned them down and uh, had this wild hair up my backside to um, put together a civil war organization, uh, which is uh, what I'm in the head of right now. So, so you put together the, uh, the education society? I did. As a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting in this, this will, uh, this will uh, help you feel real confident about your tax dollars at work. Um, slavery was dead everywhere in the United States except in Washington, D.C., and, and they, they went under a different name. They're known as contractors. And every, every member of the federal government in Washington, D.C. owned slaves. Uh, they worked uh, for Martin Marietta. They worked for Booz Allen Associates, uh, whomever, and uh, they had tons and tons of contracts. And we were expected to uh, to farm that work out to keep the contractors busy. And so when you're working uh, with airspace management and this other sort of stuff, uh, my job was managing $380 million and 
and dispensing the funds and determining what was going to get worked on, what wasn't going to get worked on, and what we we're going to do, what we weren't going to do, and then hand them out to a bunch of retired military guys and stuff that would would do it. So uh, with that, I found I had plenty of time on my hands. So everything was delegated by nine o'clock in the morning, and I wasn't going to catch train until four. So I actually, uh, when I had been commanding down in Texas, some of you may have remembered Bob Mayer, uh, who ran uh, uh, American Blue and Gray Association, Civil War um, Education Association. Uh, Bob had uh, picked my brain when I was a squadron commander down in Texas for almost a year on how to put together an organization. And I spent a lot of time talking with him. He didn't take that advice, but uh, when, when it came time for me to decide on what I wanted to do, I was living in Fredericksburg, Virginia. I had 300 uh, feet of pristine Confederate trenches in my backyard uh, overlooking Massaponics Creek. And I had long had an interest in civil war. So I spent my, my afternoons and my days just working on a business plan using government computers and, and government time to build a non-governmental organization, nonprofit. And, and, and so I, I basically built my business plan for Blue and Gray doing this and just walking back and forth to all the wonderful sites in DC and Arlington Cemetery and stuff. And so that's how, that's how Blue and Gray got started. All right. So um, from a very high level, what uh, tell us about the uh, the the mission and the uh, purpose of the society? Well, what uh, what what animated me uh, at the start and and even twenty seven years later? I mean, you go back to when I was was conceptualizing this back in nineteen ninety two ninety three is when I started it and um, uh, I incorporated in in April of ninety four. Um, uh, I had talked to Will Green and Mark Stevens and Kitty uh, at APCWS uh, down on Caroline Street, and we had spent a bit of time talking, and, and uh, Will had, had articulated what APCWS was going to do, which was going to buy dirt, and I said, well, who's going to tell the story? And so we talked a bit about it. I said, well, we'll tell the story. And um, so we, we built a, um, uh, an unofficial partnership early on. Uh, in which Will went to bat because there was a lot of, uh, as, as you, you will be surprised to find out that there's politics involved in the Civil War community and uh, that, that not everybody is willing to help everybody else out. You know, they, they, a lot of times they, they get possessive of their territory and um, we were a threat to the uh, Civil War Society, which no longer exists and uh, which I had been a part of, which Bob had had uh, had uh, been working for and um, a lot of people didn't want us to get started and Will took them on. Will uh, said no, he, he thought that we were genuine and um, uh, he, he he took on the, the board and got permission and allowed us to use their mailing list and so we mailed everybody and got 45 or 50 members and about 27 people agreed to come to our first symposium in um, in uh, October 1994, and we were off and running. My mom uh, donated five thousand dollars to uh, to give me some start. And uh, first three years, I think we took a total of uh, 94, 95, 96. I think we took in a total of about thirty-one thousand dollars in three years, and uh, it was kind of slow. It was it was a challenge. But um, you know, so I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't answer. I didn't answer your 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 specific <laughs> question. We put we put the organization together uh, basically to um, to uh, to tell the story of American battlefields to help to help preserve Civil War history by telling a story of Civil War history. And so, whereas APCWS and the Civil War Trust, which had come about as a result of the of the uh, Civil War Sites Advisory Commission recommendations, there were two groups out there designed primarily to buy dirt, and we aligned ourselves as a people who would put the interpretive signs out there basically. And that was our, that was our initial plan. And our first sign was the, the site marker for uh, Port Republic, uh, uh, the old, um, um, gosh, now I uh, can't even remember the name, just a little small uh, uh, hill there um, at Port Republic, uh, the, the coaling. We put, we put up a, a site sign at the coaling. That was our first job. And then our, our second job was to, uh, was to provide the, uh, the matching funds 
uh, we provided $9,000 for the, um, or no, $3,000 so that APCWS could get $9,000 to build a parking lot at McDowell. And so those were our, our first couple of projects. Um, and then our first interpretive project was at the North Anna where we put 10 signs uh, in uh, the North Anna Ox, Oxford Battlefield Park. Right. You know, so many of the uh, civil war organizations have been adversely affected by the pandemic. Uh, what's been the effect on the society? Well, the organization has, ha has had a good run. I mean, we're, we're in our 27th year now. And um, uh, we have, the thing that I've noticed by studying the statistics of our organization, our donors, we're, we're an organization right now of about 475, 480 people. We've grown, we had, we had attrited down a bit. And uh, in the last year, uh, because of some things that we have done, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on, um, we've added about 100 members in the last 12 months. And um, uh, so as, as we built ourselves up, our, our revenue base has always been about 50-50 between donations, projects, and uh, seminar uh, tours. And so we were running in a budget on average of about 300 to 350,000 a year. And our, our, um, uh, our expenses usually ran around 300 a year. And uh, with the loss, we did um, the first couple of programs of, uh, of 2020, we did four programs um, in January, February, the first week of March before we got shut down. And in that time, um, uh, we, uh, oh, we did about, uh, we spent about $25,000 on those four programs and uh, we had other registrations and we then just got shut down completely. And so um, uh, the impact was that uh, if I backed out what my costs would be uh, from my typical year, which would have been $300,000 in expenditure, then um, uh, if I backed out what it would cost me to support those tours, it looked like our budget was going to be about $180,000 to continue doing what we were doing for this year. And so that's what I, I started working on. And, and when I sat down and looked at everything, um, we found ourselves with about a $65,000 uh, negative uh, bogey that we had to find money to repair, replace. And I'm pleased to say that by and large, um, the membership has been extraordinarily generous and supportive. And um, uh, it looks like we're going to get through um, this, this pandemic with our, uh, with our operations intact until we can get out again. Now, now what I don't know is I don't know when I can get back out in the field again. I'm hoping in January, I think that's probably a, a pipe dream, more realistic if we do get a, if we do get uh, a vaccine and people start to get a level of confidence, um, maybe March, April, I'm hopeful we may be able to get back. But, uh, but the pandemic for what is worth, uh, uh, I mean, there were some things I wanted to do. I, I, I'm only a, really a one man shop with maybe four or five uh, part-time contractors and assistants. Uh, I had uh, one employee um, and um, I, it reached a point with what we were doing that um, uh, we did get a PPP loan that, uh, that helped us out. But with the loss of the tour program and stuff, they're just, we didn't have enough revenue to support two employees. So I had to let the, uh, the other person go. But yeah. We seem to be doing okay now. Uh, you know, things are things are coming together, and you, you you can't stop moving forward. Even you know, if you if you're if you're swimming, you're trying to swim the English Channel. If you stop swimming, you're going to sink. And uh, so we kept swimming, and we 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 slowed down a little bit, and and so forth. But we're we're swimming slowly but surely. I think we'll get there. You know, uh, that's that's true for the English Channel, and it's probably true for the Straits of Juan de Fuca. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, Bill Miller uh, uh, gave me the hint that perhaps it would be a good idea if if folks would uh, open up the chat. That's the button just to the left of the uh, the green uh, share screen button. 
and and uh, would like for you to put your uh, your questions and comments in the chat. Um, Lynn, I, I know the society is engaged in a wide variety of activities, so let's talk projects. Sure. I understand one of your projects is developing Fort Branch interpretive signs. Sure. Tell me, where is Fort Branch and what is that all about? <laughs> well, well, as soon as I tell you, it's, I'm going to let the secret out of the bag. Everybody knows exactly where it is. It's in Hamilton, North Carolina. There, there we go. Okay, so everybody knows, no more questions. It's on the Albemarle River, or on the Roanoke River, excuse me. And um, uh, those of you who remember the CSS Albemarle, the Albemarle uh, moved up and down the Roanoke River. Um, the Fort Branch was built inland after Burnside's um, uh, operations on the Outer Banks uh, because the, just like the York and the James River in Virginia were daggers towards the, uh, Richmond, uh, so too were the Roanoke and Albemarle Rivers off of the uh, Albemarle uh, Sound. They were daggers into the central part of North Carolina, particularly threatening the Weldon Railroad and the railroad down to Wilmington. And so uh, early on, North Carolina determined to find some way to try to restrict uh, the, uh, the, the ability of, of Burnside to probe inland. And so they built uh, Fort Branch, an earthen fortification that overlooked about 90 feet up overlooking uh, the, uh, the Roanoke River. And uh, uh, it never, never took uh, a whole lot of shells and anger, but it did, um, uh, it did in fact um, uh, serve its purpose. It did uh, deny the Federals uh, the opportunity to move up and down the river and uh, it had been maintained, it's on private property, but the property owners realized that they had something special and important and they've always maintained it. They allowed the reenactors not to uh, mess with the fort itself, but rather to set up quarters near the fort and stuff that they could have uh, training and camps and so forth. And, and we went there on a, on a tour, we were doing a, a Burnsides program and, and um, um, uh, Wade Sokolowski and, uh, Steve Wise took us there as part of that, and as I walked through and looked at the at the um, at the fort, um, I said, "God, these guys they need some interpretation." There's no no signs here that hand you a sheet of paper and you know stop one, two, three, four, five, and they had a little sign and stuff. I said, "Well, you know, this is what we do." Uh, so mm -hmm. we we went up and we offered them um, uh, eight uh, 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 an interpretive program. Uh, and uh, that has resulted in 18 signs that are uh, being fabricated now. We've finished the um, interpretation, everything on them. Gloria Swift was our historian. Uh, Doug Cummings, a volunteer in blue and gray who had been board president a couple of years ago. Doug was overlooking the project. And um, uh, um, Scott Williams, who is uh, um, uh, an engineer in Chesterfield County, Virginia, who we worked with on the Bermuda 100 interpretation and the North Anna, second North Anna interpretation. Um, he has designed the signs for us. So uh, we're gonna put those 18 signs in the ground. Uh, I think we'll probably have them in the ground before uh, Thanksgiving. And with that, we'll now have uh, almost 200 signs in the ground around the country. Wow, that's pretty neat. So uh, we know that the restoration and repurposing of the Pamplin Cannon carriage has been delayed. What's the status of that project? Well, we just delivered it for refurbishment today. As a matter of fact, um, um, Burford uh, Smith, who is a uh, also a volunteer at Blue and Gray, uh, he drove up uh, from Atlanta to Chatham, which is about 400 miles, um, on Monday, and he took the Blue and Gray uh, van over to uh, Pamplin Park and picked up the carriage. And he carried it 750 miles to uh, Jackson, Mississippi uh, today. And um, uh, the, the vendors over there are going to take a look at it. Um, we have a real rough estimate of about uh, $10,500 to refurbish that. That's pretty near close to the price of a brand new one. And I've, I've told them uh, they ought to look and see if they can do this for in the range of between five and seven thousand dollars. So we'll 
we'll see in the negotiation. I've given Burford the authority to uh, make the determination as to uh, whether or not he'll leave the cannon with them. If not, um, they may uh, do some re refurbishing of it on um, on um, uh, in west of Atlanta where he lives. He has some people to do that. Because what I really think has happened with that is is that uh, it just got left out as a wooden carriage, got left out in the rain too long for 11 years. It started to crack and stuff. And I think people panicked over it. I'm not sure it, it was in horrific, horrific conditions. So we may just be able to, um, to uh, put some wood putty in it and a few other things. And we may be able to do it for a real good, for a real good price. And then uh, we haven't decided where to repurpose it yet. Um, what we may do is we may either put it um, uh, either at Sailor Creek, Chris Calkins had wanted an operating cannon, or we might put it at um, uh, Fort Pocahontas, which is near um, uh, President John Tyler's plantation, Sherwood Forest, where Wilson's Wharf was. Or we might, um, we might make it as a gift um, uh, to the um, Fort Branch people because they do have some, they have seven of the original tubes that were at the fort during the Civil War that they fished out of the river in the last 20 years and stuff. And some of them are just sitting on the ground. And so uh, we may be able to uh, remount one of the original cannons in the fort on a proper size wooden carriage. So many options there. When I think that will finally end up is, um, I think we'll probably finish that project in um, uh, in the spring of next year, and and um, pass that on. Um, I it's too early for me right now. My working figure, I, I've got about four thousand dollars excess uh, that we we raised for um, uh, for the replacement of the carriage at Pamplin Park because we we kicked in the membership kicked in fifty five hundred dollars is our share of a, of a new metal carriage for Pamplin Park. And, um, uh, but the, when we went out to raise funds, the people replied really strongly and we had about $4,000 more than we, than we needed. Uh, we asked for 55, we got 95. So, um, so that's a start for us on the, on the refurbishment. And uh, once I get a better sense as to what we're actually going to do with that and whether or not we're going to put a tube on it or whether we're going to cost share that with somebody, I anticipate that being a, um, a funding project that we'll have to raise some money for in the spring to, to do and finish that project anywhere from maybe 3000 up to as much as 13, 14, 15,000 if it involves putting a new tube on it. Wow. So uh, the Medford Historical Society has a photographic collection that the society has been involved with. Um, how, how did that happen and, and what is the involvement? Well, that's another one of those projects that, you know, one of the nice things about Blue and Gray and, and, and indeed I would say for all round tables, I've mentioned this to you before and, and, and it's not, this is not uh, rocket science is that, uh, <laughs> Civil War people are generous people, and they and they're passionate about their Civil War. And um, and and if you have a good project and you articulate it well, and you're realistic in your cost expenditures, uh, they'll support it, and they'll provide the funds you need to get the job done. In the case of Medford, Medford goes back about 22 years is our first contact with them, and uh, says something for our for our will, staying stay puttedness and stuff too. It took 20 years to finish the project, the initial project, and now we have the secondary uh, benefits of it. But the initial project was um, uh, uh, back in the in the late 80s, about 100 years after uh, General Samuel um, Lawrence, who had been the mayor of Medford, um, uh, the uh, Sam Lawrence, who had been the mayor of Medford, um, had he collected photographs of the 19th century the way we collected baseball cards in the 60s and stuff. He just had a huge trunk full of them and they just sat there. Well, when when he passed on, he left his stuff. He had been a mayor of Medford um, uh, and he just left this trunk of, of images and stuff there. And 
the Medford people didn't know what the hell it was. They never opened it, didn't bother to look at it. And for a hundred years, these photos just sat in a, sat in a trunk. And then uh, they opened it and said, whoa, what is this? And somebody had a, had a connection with Brian Pahanka uh, and Brian uh, went up and took a look at it, was just overawed by what he saw and uh, said, you guys have to preserve this. And uh, they said, how? And um, uh, Brian wrote a, a book about it initially. And, and then he gave him some, some quick advice. He basically said, well, first thing you got to do is you got to catalog it. Well, they came to us looking to catalog it. So this would be back around 1998, maybe, 97, 98. And um, uh, they were looking, they were trying to raise $6,500. They needed, um, they needed uh, 2,500 for the scanners and the, the computers and stuff and the, the hard drives. They need about $4,000 to buy the, uh, the software, uh, uh, the uh, software that was necessary for the scanning and, and digitization, all the stuff they were going to do. And um, they asked us if we could make a contribution. I asked them how much they were looking for and they said 6,500 and I thought about it a little bit and I looked at some of our folks and I called a couple of people and I said, we need to make a hit. Uh, can we do this? And the folks said, yeah. And so I said, we'll fund it all. And so, so they were looking to raise 6,500 for various sources. And we, we provided all $6,500. And, uh, and then they spent 20 years trying to figure out how to scan the things and, <laughs> and God bless them. Uh, they're a nonprofit as well with everybody being volunteers and stuff. And that asked questions, we give them advice. We'd try to help them with it and stuff. And then they, that they, they didn't want help from, a, they were Yankees and they didn't want help from a bunch of Southerners who knew everything and stuff. And um, uh, we went back and forth, back and forth, but eventually they did, get, they did get them all scanned about two or three years ago and they, they got them posted up online. Um, and we had worked with them on several things. They had done a display that had, that had gone around Massachusetts and New England showing what the images were. Cause there's 3,800 of them front and back. I mean, this is a big collection, biggest private collection I, I know of anywhere. And um, uh, we just, they asked, what should we do next? And I said, well, what are you trying to do? And they said, well, we want to make it available to everybody. I said, do you want to make any money off it? He said, well, we're, we're letting some people rent some of the images and stuff. But um, uh, I said, what do you really want to do? And they said, we just want people to have access to them. I said, okay, well, this is what we'll do. And, and I said, if you don't object, give us access to your thing. So we have permission to use the entire collection for any reason whatsoever. But what we promised them we would do is we'd try to increase the visibility and help them by increasing their, by, by trying to improve the provenance of what each image stands for. And so about six months ago, we started a project in which every Wednesday we send out a blanket email uh, to about 6,000 people with the image. And after three or four months, we finally figured out and we asked people to tell us what it is and who, how, when, what, and where. And uh, we found some, some real eagle eyes out there and stuff. And what we started doing about a month and a half ago is we started also putting what the previous week's image was and what we found out about it on there before we introduced the next week's image. And then we share all that image in, information with Medford so that they can improve what they know about their collection and stuff. And so we have just now hired a part-time professional photo editor, Jane Martin, who worked, she did our photographic work for the uh, guidebook with the National Geographic, the, the, uh, the four books we did with National Geographic, the guidebook, she was the photo editor for that. She's now the photo editor for this. We're going through right now, we're going through about 200 and some odd images a year uh, she's going to accelerate that. We hope to go through the entire collection within five, six, seven years, um, uh, paying about uh, this project. I expect is going to cost about six thousand dollars a year each year for the for the labor. But Jane's a professional in this, and and it's it's progressing. So uh, and that's something anybody can get a hold of. I mean, if you guys are not yet getting the Blue and Gray Education Society dispatch. Um, perhaps you can you can just share a connection with them, or just share it with your people. Uh, forward one, and and then you guys can just ring back in and join it, and you'll get these things automatically every week. All right. So I know that the society has been developing 
scholarly monographs for nearly 20 years. Tell us about that. Well, you know, if you're going to be an education organization, you got to be multifaceted. And, and um, uh, if we weren't going to buy dirt and we never have and never have intended to, then we had to, um, we had to look at the various components of, of what kept people interested in the war. And one of the things that came up early on in the process was that there are a lot of really interesting things that uh, deserve to be uh, memorialized, but maybe weren't worthy of a full length book, you know, a two, three, four hundred page book. And so we set up a, an outline, this, the papers of the Blue and Gray Education Society, which was set and targeted to be a 64 page uh, document inclusive of images, maps, whatever else it was going to be. Uh, that we would try to initially, we we're going to try to put out four a year, but you know, that's I, I can eat that whole apple pie in one sitting too. Yeah, you know, I'm, <laughs> the only, if I'm the only guy, there's a limit to what I can do. And um, uh, so, as it turned out, uh, we ended up doing uh, about 19 of them over a period of time, uh, over about maybe a um, 10 year period. And um, we we migrated. The very first one we did was Lincoln and Lincoln's. Uh, visit to Richmond that was done by Mike Litterist, who is the um, who is the uh, public relations guy for the National Park Service. Now you always see him on the mall and stuff, but Mike was just a a scrub ranger at uh, at uh, Fredericksburg and a neighbor of mine. When I asked him to write the first monograph, uh, uh, his, he came as a he came as a peacemaker was the name of the monograph, and we subsequently did um, nineteen of them. Uh, that were distributed automatically. Each one cost us about uh, $2,000 to produce and, and uh, then distribute. Um, and we gave each one, we gave it a free one to every member uh, when they came out. Uh, and then we, we kept our stock and we put it on the, on the internet for people who could order them. Um, but we haven't marketed it terribly well, but they're, they're, very fascinating uh, books. Uh, three or four of them have gone out of print. Um, one of them has uh, has uh, printed over almost 4,000 copies. That's one that Parker Hills did on uh, a study in war fighting, Nathan Bedford Forrest and the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, which has proven to be very, very popular over the past 20, 24 years. Um, so we've done 4,000 of those. Most of them, though, we, we end up doing about 800 to 1,000. And the one we're doing uh, that that is uh, being printed as I as I speak um, is uh, the Grand Gulf Scenic Byway, uh, which um, uh, is going to primarily emphasize. It starts with Grand Gulf, tells the history of Grand Gulf, uh, the Battle of Grand Gulf. Then it talks about Grant's move against um, the Mississippi uh, Central Railroad, and then uh, commences or. or uh, concludes with the uh, battle, uh, uh, walking tour of the Battle of Raymond. So it's a 96-page uh, document with full color on the four co covers, and it is due from the printers on the uh, first or second of November. And so that will be distributed free to each member of Blue and Gray the first part of uh, November, and then additional copies. Um, uh, this was a more expensive one to put out. Additional copies will. Uh, sell retail for $15 plus uh, plus $5 shipping. So, um, but it's a very useful, I mean, it'd be very useful for somebody visiting the, visiting the area. Uh, it would be a tour guide for them. Right. So is General Hills the, uh, the author? Yeah, he was the author, he's the author of this uh, last one as well. So this is the second one with us. And um, uh, the, the inner, the only thing that what broke us with the, um, with the uh, monographs were in between, we ended up striking a partnership with the uh, National Geographic Society, which started in 2003 and um, ran from 2003 to 2016. We're actually, we're still in it. I, I just uh, sent in uh, comments on a, on a uh, book that Nat Geo is coming out with uh, by Winston Groom, who recently passed away. Uh, okay. that uh, they wanted me to, they asked me some questions about that. So we still work with the junior reporter that, or the junior editor that did the first book, Fields of Honor, which has sold 70,000 copies since 2006. Um, uh, 
she is now the editor in chief and publisher for National Geographic Books. And so that, that friendship has endured for us. And we did four books, um, the last one being the guidebook, of course, that came out in 2016, which is the largest guidebook the National Geographic has ever published. It's 512 pages, full color. Um, and we're in talks right now about doing one for the American Revolution, which we've already completed the manuscript with Bert Dunkerley, but uh, I'm not sure yet that we can uh, pony up. I haven't even discussed it with my board yet. Um, some of them are on this, on this uh, conference call, but um, I just got a, a note back from, uh, from Lisa and she said probably they would need about 150,000 for that. We put 100,000 into the guidebook that, that our membership raised. And again, it's a tribute to the Civil War community that they came up with this kind of money to make this happen. Uh, the overall cost of printing the guidebook was about 400,000. We put 100,000 into it. So um, so that's why th that, that was a separation because as we started doing full length books, uh, we didn't have the time to do monographs again, too much, too med too much uh, cooking in the kitchen. Uh, so I couldn't do monographs and do these books as well. So, so you you also have a wounded warriors uh, program. How was that conceived, and what is that all about? Well, um, one of our earliest members, um, uh, Vince Dimatina, who I had worked with in the Air Force, going back all the way to about 1981. Uh, Vinny is still working as a contract guy, he's 70 years old now, but he's, he's still, he's still a Beltway bandit and, um, uh, living in the Beltway, um, the yellow ribbon fund when, uh, the casualty rates were coming back pretty hot and heavy from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, they were standing up groups. You may remember there had been a lot of criticism that Walter Reed was not ready for the, for the, for the, for the uh, for the, uh, soldiers that were coming back. And so, a lot of outside money got poured in and, and friends and nonprofit groups got involved in there. And as these soldiers came back and were just vegetating in the, in the hospital after they had had their, their surgeries and everything else, they were, they were screaming for stuff to do in the system. The M morale welfare recreation system was not well situated for supporting that. And uh, so people got together and they just started putting together different programs. Well, Dee Matina, who is a BGS member number 10, uh, he, he joined when I was at FAA one day when I was uh, uh, working on government time, uh, working on my, my, my new organization. Um, he came and said, what are you doing, Len? I told him, he said, count me in. And he's, he's uh, put a hundred dollar check down on the table every year for 27 years now to support the organization. He came back to me, he said, Len, he says, I, I just started working with this new group over here, the Yellow Ribbon Fund out of, out of uh, Bethesda, or not Bethesda, out of uh, the old Walter Reed, because uh, Bethesda is now the new Walter Reed. But, uh, and they are looking for stuff for soldiers to do and families to do. Why don't you do one of your tours and stuff? And so um, I said, sure. I went and I met with Marie Wood, who was the, um, who was the executive director of the, of, um, the Yellow Ribbon Fund. And, uh, we then went and met with the, um, with the hospital people at uh, Walter Reed and Bethesda, and um, uh, they agreed to allow us to conduct the tours uh, under fairly stringent requirements because we had soldiers on medication and with pins together. I mean, it, the, the wounds were horrific. The first year, uh, we, in any given tour, we might take 25 people, which were maybe 10 soldiers and maybe 15 or 20 family members on a bus. And um, the soldiers had their legs blown off, arms blown off, you know, just disfigured horrifically. And um, uh, most in wheelchairs or needing stuff. And so it was a high maintenance thing, but it was all done as a volunteer. Nobody got paid anything. And members of the Blue and Gray contributed money to help pay for the bus. Uh, which which took people around and the just the cost of supporting it because you know you need hotel room and other things like that but and to pay for we'd take them for a lunch we'd get books of the of the place we were going so they could read that stuff but as it turned out it really just uh, in many instances it was a it was therapeutic it was to get the soldiers 
out of their hospital rooms. Uh, then, and that was 13 years ago, and, and we continued doing about eight tours a year uh, for, um, for all that time up until COVID uh, shut us down this year. Um, the, the nature of the wounds has migrated. We, you know, we, we, they closed Walter Reed and moved it over to Bethesda. Uh, the Navy runs Bethesda. They, they're hard to work with. Sorry, Harry, they are. Um, and so we kind of went away from them, but uh, we then morphed over to Fort Belvoir, uh, which had warrior transition battalions because once the soldiers have recovered from their war wounds, um, uh, they then have to go through medical boards because they may be medically retired and draw a pension for the rest of their life as a result of their war wounds. And it takes a long time for the government to determine if they're going to be retired. So what we have now and for the last three or four years working out of Fort Belvoir is we're dealing with people with traumatic brain injuries. The, you know, they did, their brains just got scrambled by the, by the IEDs and stuff. And people who are waiting to be med boarded uh, to determine what they're doing. And so uh, we, we find that what this has turned into is just a good group of folks. And um, uh, we have 10 or 15 members of Blue and Gray are wounded warriors who joined us afterwards. And, um, uh, you know, anybody who has been around with us and stuff, I mean, we had one, um, uh, uh, Jesse Fletcher and his wife uh, came out of Winston-Salem. He had both legs off um, uh, at the uh, hip. Um, as a result of the IEDs, and um, and he came and did a tour for us, and he was my he was my uh, navigator to to get us around and stuff, and it was inspirational just watching him bouncing in and out of the van with um, uh, you know uh, with with uh, his artificial uh, limbs and so forth, his smart limbs and and everything. So uh, that that is probably the most important thing we do because as we spend our time honoring the Civil War veterans. Um, and incidentally, I think this is something that round tables could get involved in as well, because so many of these warriors that are waiting have been dispersed to VA hospitals and everything around there. Um, they're not looking, you're not, you're not trying to make them expert on, on the Civil War. You're just getting them out of the damn hospital. You're giving them a, a connection with America again. And, 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 uh, these things have been heartwarming, just, just, just heartwarming. And, and uh, one, one of our board members uh, several years ago said, it's the most important thing we do, and I couldn't agree more. These, these are America's best. And, um, uh, you know, I've taken Polish soldiers around who were recovering and, and other people. Um, uh, now it's mostly Army and, uh, and, and Marines that we're taking around, and almost all are out of Fort Belvoir. But We'll continue again next year. As I said, as long as there's just one soldier that wants to go out, we've got them out of the hospital for the, for the day. We'll keep doing it. So. Wow. That's, that's beautiful stuff. So Lynn, I, I've heard something about a dispatch program. What is that? Well, you might remember, as a matter of fact, we were just kicking it off when I first met you uh, in St. Louis last year. Um, uh, we had, um, we, we were looking for a way to, so many people had said, you know, we're 25 years old and never said, never heard of you before. So we said, okay, we need to, we need to get out and get known and stuff. And, and, uh, uh, there's not a lot of really, really good free information that was out there and stuff. So what we decided to do was, was, uh, take our email list, which was about 2,500 names, see what we could do to build it. And, um, uh, just come up a couple of times a week with um, an interesting, you know, 500, 600, 700 word story about some element of the Civil War, uh, civilian, white, black, milk, whatever it might be. And we started those, we put some samples in the, in the brochures that we gave to everybody when we came to St. Louis. Shortly after that, we started sending the things out and we now have stepped up to Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Um, and uh, we built an email list is now right at, we, we reach out and we reach 6,000 people um, three times a week. And statistics tell us that uh, uh, about 2,000 people out of that 6,000 are reading some of the time. And consistently, just about every one of our dispatches 
is opened. Our low number is about 16%, which would be uh, right at uh, about 950 openings. Our high numbers are around 25, 26%, which would be uh, 1,500, 1,550 people reading it at one time. Uh, I think that is a direct attribute. I think it directly contributes to our growth in membership. Uh, like I said, we've grown about 100 people in the last 12 months, and we're, we're working a little harder to grow larger than that. But, um, but the dispatch uh, is available to everybody. And again, I'd, if, if you all are interested, what, what we really hoped would happen with this, and I guess this is my pitch back to you, Mike, uh, you're, you're dual-hatted because you're a member of Blue and Gray as well, but my pitch back to you is that, hey, this is free, doesn't cost anything. Send it to your people, have them send it on. If the people want to be sure that they're receiving them, the best thing for them to do, quite honestly, and I'll, and I'll tell you why, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why quickly, but the best way to do it is for them to come back and say, hey, add us to your email list so we can send directly to them. The reason I say that is that we have found out, and Harry Tate, who's on this call, will nod his head. He knows what I'm talking about. What we have found has happened with this is that I send you the dispatch, Mike, and you get the dispatch from me and you say, this is a really neat dispatch. I wanna share this with my friends. And so you forward it to your friends. Well, you've got a curmudgeon somewhere in your group of folks who doesn't like anybody sending me something he didn't ask for. And so what right. he does is he goes down and he looks at the thing you sent to him and he hits unsubscribe. What he just did is he didn't unsubscribe himself, he unsubscribed you because you forwarded it to him. And what he has done is he's gone into the message that's been forwarded to him and he has effectively acted for you and taken you off the list. Mm -hmm. And so that's the biggest problem we have had is that there are some people that don't wanna be bothered. You know, they, they, they're, they're, they're hardy Southerners and they get a yank, something about Grant and it pisses them off so bad they don't wanna read it. And so they, wow, fix him, delete. And, and they kick the guy who shared him out with it. So uh, I think the smartest way with that to get this in the hands of more people, and it's really worth the effort. I mean, people like it. If you really want, go to our website and look under about BGS and go down. We've got every one of them listed down there. So you can open every one of them in our archives thing. And if any of you who are listening are interested in that, go to the uh blue and gray education.org look under our member you know under about blue and gray you'll find it and then just click down on that and you'll see the uh dispatches and and stuff there but it's a really neat thing and and what is done it's helped us to grow and uh we're continuing to do that we uh uh we send it uh we we plan them and schedule them a month in advance and so we have uh everything lined up for october and i'll uh, send uh, I'll send November over to uh, Barbara Kennedy, who's my uh, IT person, and she'll line up November here in the next week or two. Very nice. Let's go ahead and throw it open to uh, to chat. Uh, sure. Bill says, uh, Len, you re uh, you replied to the Williamsburg Civil War Roundtable back in May to confirm a contribution for a carriage repair at Pamphlin. You also mentioned that you wished to reach our to or to our group um, to join BGES. I suspect that the virus has caused you to hold off, but we will look forward to hearing from you. And by the way, I've been to Fort Branch with our local tour group. There you have it. There we so are. We so it, it's not as obtuse as, as you might think. And um, uh, uh, the, the projects, you know, I, I think what's fun about this, and I, I think we're talking to friends when, when, when we talk among groups here. I'm no different than you guys. I just, you know, I was in a career change, and this was something that was really important to me. And, and um, uh, these projects are not huge. They're not $100,000 projects generally. They just they take care of what needs to be done. And the, and the beauty of them is you just say, okay, we're going to tackle it and we're going to get it done. And we do. And we get it mm -hmm. done on time. We get it done on budget. Um, Bill, what you had mentioned with the, um, with the thing of the, um, uh, of the carriage thing, we, 
it wasn't worded exactly the right way, but it's pretty close to it. What you did is you contributed when we were raising the money for the replacement of the carriage at Pamplin Park, you contributed, I believe, to that uh, project. And that was the 9,500. I said, we asked for 55, we raised 95. We got about 4,000 to start us in the refurbishment of the wooden carriage that we replaced. And that's the carriage that we just delivered to Jackson, Mississippi today. So uh, in answer to your question, um, yeah. And, and to reach out to your group, uh, I'm often in Williamsburg. Um, once we get a little space in this, let's let's get together and uh, and have a short visit if you'd like. Good. So that works. All right. So uh, Harry says, Len, don't forget the following projects completed by BGES over the years: signage at Bermuda 100, Virginia, and Grand Gulf, Mississippi artillery pieces at Raymond, uh, Mississippi, Fort Clinch, Florida, and Pamplin Park, Virginia. Also, the restoration project for hundreds of civil or uh, Confederate states photos at Medford, Massachusetts, and many others. Also, Harry is uh, a little verbose. Also, converting <laughs> many <laughs> <Navy> guys. <laughs> All those Navy guys, uh, tour tapes, to the web. Yeah, I guess of the things in there, I'll, I'll try, it, just like Harry, never to give me too much to address at one time. So let me try to, let me try to run through this quickly. Um, we have put, as I mentioned earlier, we have almost 200 signs deployed around the country. We've got about 25 at the North Anna on the two trails we have. Uh, we did 43 signs to uh, interpret the Bermuda 100 campaign. We did uh, another, um, uh, 35 signs at Grand Gulf Park, uh, which was restoring the original signs that had been installed uh, back in the 1960s. Um, we, um, there, there are 25 uh, cannon on the battlefield at Raymond, blue and gray members uh, contributed directly or through the blue and gray, uh, about 16 of them. Uh, so uh, we, we made the largest single contribution that the Friends of Raymond has ever received. Um, uh, so we're about 40,000 of that. We put 17 signs in at uh, South Mountain, which was about a $50,000 project back in 2002. We put 10 signs at uh, Cedar Creek, eight at, um, at uh, Holly Springs, Mississippi, uh, 18 at Paraville. Um, uh, we put, you know, we had the cannon. We, uh, we put the cannon at, um, um, uh, what's, what's the hell's the name of the, the corner um, at Fredericksburg, the guy who opened fire. Um, um, the gallant. The youngster, Pelham. Yeah, gallant Pelham. So we put in, we put a piece of artillery at Pelham's corner. We put in a piece of artillery at uh, Fort Clinch. Uh, we did the artillery piece at, um, uh, at um, uh, Pamplin Park. And, um, then the, uh, the, the dispatches, uh, which you're aware, or not dispatches, but the uh, archives, uh, we have about 350 lectures from Blue and Gray archives that my dad recorded from uh, 1994 to 2004 or no, 2005 or six maybe. Um, and uh, we are in the process of converting them. They, they started on eight millimeter tape they went to VHS, they've gone to DVD, and now they're being converted to uh, MP4 files, uh, which we will put up on our website and we'll soon have, by the springtime, we'll start putting these up at the end of this month, first part of next month. Uh, the project's a $25,000 project right now. I've raised a little over $14,500 so far. We're in the midst of fundraising for that. Um, and um, we expect to have about 500 hours worth of lectures online by early summer next, next year. We'll start putting them online, but as we finish the entire project, and then I've got another two or 3,000 hours of, of battlefield tours that I haven't evaluated yet to determine whether or not we can or should put some of those 
up on the web for people to access. But including this 15 hours of, uh, of, of individual Ed Barr's lectures, not include his time on the battlefield. Um, um, we have over 100 different historians out of these 350 tapes, uh, many of them who have gone to the last roundup, Bud Robertson um, and folks like that. So, so uh, that project, Harry, I think I cut, I caught all of them, hopefully. Um, I don't know, did I forget anything that Harry wanted me to promote? You know, no, Harry, not bad for an Air Force guy. <laughs> well, we, get, we Air Force guys can retain most everything. We don't need, uh, we don't need to remember there's only 12 steps from point A to point B on a ship. Yeah, follow the red line. So yep. Nancy says, talk about Ed Barr's papers and BGES. Sure. Um, well, that's, that is a, um, okay. Uh, there's, there's good news, good news, and bad news. Uh, or good news, bad news, good news. Uh, the good news is about, um, about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, I sat down with Ed and, you know, I, I just it was at his house. I said, Ed, what are you going to do with all this stuff in your house? What about your archives and stuff? He says, I'm not sure. He says, I'd like to get this put in an archive somewhere and stuff. I said, where do you want them to go? And he, he said, well, I'm a Marine. I said, okay, let me, let me see what I can do. So I got a hold of Mike Miller down at uh, Quantico and uh, said, Mike, uh, the great man wants um, to set up his archives at uh, the Marine Corps University. And, and so we went through the uh, Marine Corps Foundation and the archives and we, we got most everything out. There was like uh, 100 and, 140 boxes full. Ed was a very, very organized and meticulous man. And he touched about everything and people had collected lots of bits and pieces and stuff. And so we started putting together the archive in the archival section of the Marine Corps Library, the uh, Edmund uh, Gray Library at Quantico. And um, there was some question had come up because uh, the, the big question was protecting Ed's legacy. Uh, when he died, the fear was, was that people would run out and start publishing anything that they had with Ed and start to flood the system. And we decided uh, that, that was not what Ed wanted done. He wanted an orderly fashion. He didn't want to stand in the way of anybody uh, using his papers, but he also didn't want his stuff just willy nilly being, uh, being uh, uh, printed and, and put out there for anybody just to sell and stuff. So he, uh, he, he delegated his, um, uh, his uh, rights, his intellectual, intellectual property rights to blue and gray with me as the executor of that. And I worked with uh, several lawyers who are parts of the bars brigade and stuff. And um, uh, we had set the thing up in the Marines. We, we ran into a conflict with the Marines. We wanted to open the archives up, but, but put restrictions on the usage, the fair usage of it. And the Marines said, nope, if you open them up, they've got to be open and they can be used for anything. And, no restrictions, and we have to have them. They, we have to be the managers of them. Well, that wasn't the intention, and the lawyers wanted to protect Ed's papers for at least 10 years after he had passed, which wasn't to stop people from having access. It was only to allow them uh, to be forced to submit fair usage to Blue and Gray so that we would somebody look to make sure he wasn't being exploited uh, uh, or, or unfairly used. And um, we were fine with that up until Ed's health took a turn. And as, as, his, uh, as his health turned on him, um, his, his support base changed a bit and um, his family took a more active role in supporting him. Uh, and they went through all his papers and with him being in his 90s and stuff, they made decisions, they got power of attorney and they, they came back and they rescinded our power, our, um, our uh, 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 letter of gift from Ed to manage and do this stuff. And so they took all possession of that back again. And so Ed's papers are in order. They're where they're supposed to be at Quantico. 
but the manager of his papers is his daughter, Jenny. And um, uh, she hasn't asked my advice or contacted me um, in the last year since she uh, rescinded our uh, management of that. Uh, but I do know that they're in good order there. And so I would presume uh, Bill Vodra is who she's talking to. He's one of the lawyers who she, he lived in DC and worked with him and stuff. So my presumption is that, because Bill's been in touch with me and I've done a data dump to him as to what needs to be done to open the archives up. So I hope that they'll open them fairly soon, but um, uh, Blue and Gray doesn't have an active role in that right now. And it wasn't anything wrong or anything. She just wanted to protect her dad. And she looked at, I, I heard she looked at a lot of things and perceived that those might be exploiting her dad. And she didn't want that to happen. So she protected dad. And, and so she has all the responsibility for all the stuff that, um, that passed in his estate. Right. So, uh, Lynn, do you have anything to, uh, to share with us before we close? Uh, no, I, I, I admire all of what you're doing out there. For those of you who came along with us um, um, uh, who are part of Blue and Gray, thank you for what you do. For those of you who aren't a member of Blue and Gray, we'd really love to have you. Go to our website and you can, you can support us in any many, number of ways. As you can tell by looking through the website, we get a we get a lot of bang for our buck and um, uh, we don't have a lot of overhead. We just do what we do and we get things done and we would welcome you to join us. So Mike, thank you for what you're doing. I'm really excited for you and look forward to partnering with you guys more in the future. Um, and thank you for the opportunity you've given me tonight to speak with folks. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. And, uh, and folks, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing you at the next Blue and Gray Education Society tour. <laughs>